Welcome to my favorite chapter of Outliers, Chapter 6, Harlan, Kentucky. Let's get started with the reading guide. I'm going to start out by showing you a video of one of my favorite bands that plays a certain kind of music, so influenced by Kentucky bluegrass music. Here we go. That's just a taste of some great hillbilly music. You'll notice it's kind of violent, all right? A little revenge song. But that perfectly sets up this chapter six about Harlan, Kentucky, and the violent people that lived in the mountains of Kentucky there. If you like that song, it's by a really great ba band called the Avett Brothers. A-V-E-T-T -T Brothers. Check it out if you liked it. But in this chapter, Gladwell is going to explore the world of a couple of people, and specifically a group of people that live in the Appalachian Mountains, note that we uh, refer to as usually hillbillies, which is kind of a derogatory term towards them. He starts out by telling us that some of these folks, such as the Hatfield family and the McCoy family, shortly after the Civil War, up and down this, this uh, mountain chain, these families like the Hatfields and McCoys were basically going to war with one another over really small insults and really wiping each other out. And he's going to study and explain why this might have gone on. You should be familiar with the Hatfields and McCoys, but if you're not, I give you this. So that was a trailer from an HBO miniseries event about the Hatfield and McCoy feud. It's based on true events that happened between these two families. While the Hatfields and McCoys are probably the most famous feuding family in the Appalachian Mountains, they're by no means the only one, which is what Gladwell is going to talk about. He's going to talk about uh, two families that lived on the border between West Virginia and Kentucky in Harlan, Kentucky. He's going to tell us about the rough conditions of Harlan, Kentucky that might have helped cause this mountainous forest range, hard-working people trying to scratch out a living in a real inhospitable place. And he's going to show us that up and down the same mountain range, there were all of these different families that were getting in all-out wars with one another over small insults, over things that could be resolved. And he's going to suggest that this has everything to do with where those families' heritage came from. 
even though not many of these warring families were shepherds, he's going to suggest that because their great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were shepherds in mountainous re regions of Scotland and Ireland um, and places like that, that there was a certain way of thinking about the world that they inherited from their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents that helped cause all of these fights. See, shepherds have to protect their flock, and this means not only from predators, but they have to actually protect them from other people looking to steal their flock, because when you are raising cattle of any kind, each cattle, each, each cow or each sheep um, is big money, and it's how your family survives, and so if someone thinks they can come while you're not paying attention and steal some of your cattle, then they will, so if you're perceived as weak, in this kind of culture, you will lose all of what you have to support your family. And this has been true of the shepherding culture throughout history. What would happen is, is one shepherd would insult another shepherd or point out that another shepherd is weak. And in order to defend themselves, they would have to have a very public fight to prove to whoever was watching that they are not weak and they shouldn't be messed with. And they did this to survive and to be able to keep their only means of supporting their family together. But there's this long history of, of these people from these certain mountainous reason, regions where it's really hard to scratch out a living, getting in fights in public and, and, and getting in these feuds in public and, and doing these things to let people know they're not weak. And what Gladwell is going to present to us is that this still has a profound effect on a lot of people today. He's going to talk about this study done by Richard Nisbet and Dov Cohen called Culture of Honor, the Psychology of Violence in the South. And he's going to examine how it matters what your great, great, great grandparents did and where they came from, even if you never met them or knew them, because there are certain cultures that persist and get passed down from generation to generation. In this case of the battles going on in West Virginia and Kentucky, the, the culture is called a culture of honor. This culture of honor that's particularly present in people growing up in the South that have predominantly Scotch-Irish background or the mountainous regions of Spain and the Basque area, that this culture of honor persists and that if someone's insulted, they fight still in public as if they were a shepherd. Even though there's no cattle around to fight over, or even though that's not the image that they have to protect, this idea that if you're someone with honor, you stand up for yourself and, and you stick up for yourself in public still persists today. He, maybe he's going to explain why we still have public fights like this in certain cultures, in certain places, it's more prevalent. And, and uh, in the South, it's far more prevalent than in the North or in other regions. He's going to explain those connections and explain how that possibly might be and what that might have to do with success. All you're responsible for is filling out your strategy log for this chapter. So make sure that you're identifying at least one rhetorical strategy that Gladwell uses per section in your strategy log.